darkness crawls across the land. The midnight hour is close at hand. Creatures crawl in search of blood to terrorize your neighborhood. And whosoever shall be- Wait, hold on, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, back up a second now. Is that really how this song goes? Blood doesn't rhyme with neighborhood, how did Vincent Price do that? Well, this intro's ruined, so let's go ahead and just jump right into it. Hello, boils and ghouls! It's the greatest time of the year. It's Halloween season. It's that time when I get to let my inner horror nerd run free. And today, ooh, we've got a special video plan. Because we're going to build the roster for the scariest fighting game of all time. Fighting game fans, and welcome to Build the Roster, the show where we take a hyposcarical fighting game and build our Scream roster around it. No, wait, come back. I won't do any more puns. I promise. I promise. We're good. We're good. We're good. But man, oh man, this is a good one. This is one I have been waiting to do for the longest time. But I haven't gotten to it yet because. Well, let's be honest, if there was ever a video on this channel that would be copyright claimed, it's this one. But thanks to the support of our lovely patrons over at patreon.com slash Thorgies Arcade, I've got a bit of a safety net here in case YouTube comes in and just decides that we're not going to make any money off this episode. So thank you patrons, and if you would like to join our Patreon and get your name in the credits, early looks at videos, and vote on upcoming shows, you can find a link to that in the description down below. And if you don't want to sign up for the Patreon, but you still want to support us, you can always just subscribe and leave a comment and a thumbs up and ring that bell. All that stuff helps to let YouTube know to spread these videos around. But what subject for Build the Roster could possibly be so risky? What fighting game is just perfect for this time of year? Well folks, I'm a big horror movie fan have been ever since I was a kid. And I think it's safe to say that there is a firm overlap between horror fans and fighting game fans. Because, well to put it simply, monsters fighting each other is just cool. So there's a dream fighting game that so many people have wanted for decades now. A horror icon fighting game. Just taking the biggest names of the genre, some of the most iconic movie villains of all time, and putting them head to head. New Line Cinema spent 15 years trying to get Freddy and Jason to cross over because they knew monsters fighting each other is cool. The very first cinematic universe to ever exist was the Universal Monsters, because even back in the 40s, people knew monsters fighting each other is cool. Capcom's second best-selling original fighting game franchise was Darkstalkers because it's true in every medium you can think of, monsters fighting each other is cool. So darn it, it's time that we finally got a fully dedicated fighting game that brings together the biggest horror movie faces for one big brawl. Too bad that'll never happen because, yeah, listen folks, normally when we do a build the roster, I like to say stuff like, well, there's a chance that this could happen. Yeah, there is zero chance that this could ever happen. This is the most hypothetical roster we have ever done on this show about hypothetical rosters. And we've done Marvel vs. Capcom 4, so that's saying something. I mean, sure, there are some examples you could point to, like Dead by Daylight that has managed to get all these characters together, but Dead by Daylight was its own original property that just brought in all these guest stars through sprinkles of DLC over the course of seven years. And Dead by Daylight is a juggernaut, it's got the weight to make something like that happen. You ain't going to get a fighting game with a starting roster made up of nothing but existing horror icons. The legal quagmire around that makes my head spin just thinking about. And because of that, today, I'm just gonna go nuts. Normally, I like to have one foot in reality with these rosters. I like to think, okay, what characters could we actually have access to? Not today. Today, there's no tricks. We're just opening the bag of treats and everyone is on the table. 
Is there some crazy legal headache surrounding your character and everyone is arguing about who actually owns them and who has access to them? I don't care, they're up for grabs. Is your character owned by some massive greedy corporation that would probably demand a buttload of cash in order for them to be in your game? Money's no option because this is all imaginary, we're just doing this for fun. So no, there are no restrictions in place that will limit who could possibly be in this roster. That being said, I've got some rules for this episode that will limit who could possibly be in this roster. Yeah, it wouldn't be a build a roster if I didn't establish at least a few ground rules. What can I say? I like to challenge myself a little bit. Also, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and warn you guys right now, there's a lot of rules that I have for this particular episode, so if you don't care about that and you just want to jump ahead to the actual roster, uh, go ahead and go to the time shown below. First rule, these are all horror characters from movies. I know some people out there want me to include characters from video games. I mean, I mentioned Dead by Daylight a moment ago, and they've had characters in there such as Nemesis and Pyramid Head. But I want at least a smidge of a shared tone with all these choices, and I do feel like horror movies tend to have a different vibe than horror video games. But more importantly, the main reason I am limiting myself to just movies is because I'm still going to have a limited number of roster spots, and if I include movies, TV shows, video games, comics, creepy pastas, whatever else you want to throw in there, then suddenly this roster just fills up with the big names and that's it. And a roster that's just the big names isn't interesting. You need some surprises. So limiting our range to just horror movies makes that possible. Also, because I know someone is going to bring this up, yes, a lot of famous movie monsters originate in other sources. But if most people know them from the movies, or I feel their movie versions stand apart as their own thing, I am going to count them as movie characters. And along those same lines, the next rule is going to be a bit odd, but these characters all have to be... characters. Basically what I mean by this is, I'm not counting any of the classic movie monsters because they're all in the public domain and there's dozens of interpretations of all of them. If I say Jason Voorhees is in this, you know who I'm talking about. If I say Dracula is in this, well, am I talking about this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy? Am I even picking someone from the movies, or are we just using the general concept of the character? So, yeah, they have to be a specific character. Also, part of the magic of a roster like this is that you're bringing together all these characters who could never actually face each other. If the people who own Friday the 13th want to make Jason vs. Dracula, they could actually do that and they wouldn't even have to get permission from anybody because as I said, they're in the public domain. There's nothing special about making that crossover happen. That being said, I actually kind of want to see that crossover happen now. And lastly, and again, this is going to be a weird one, but hear me out. These have to be characters that I feel could fit into a fighting game. And I mean that in two ways. First, I have to be able to picture them having a full moveset with multiple attacks, specials, and supers. Norman Bates is one of the most iconic horror villains of all time. But even going through all the Psycho sequels, of which there are far more than you would expect, I don't think he does enough to create a full moveset out of it. The Babadook has become one of the biggest modern day horror icons. But the Babadook also doesn't really do much. He barely moves enough for us to give him a walk cycle. The Exorcist has been called one of the greatest horror films of all time by fans and critics alike. But Reagan never leaves the bed in that film. How are you supposed to create a fighting game character who never leaves the- Okay, bad example, but you get what I mean. And secondly, fighting games are here for fun. And there's some horror movies that aren't here for fun. Most horror movies are made to feel like a haunted house, or a ride, or a spectacle. But some of them are meant to be very real and depressing. And yeah, we're not going with any character from that second camp. Films like Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer or Hereditary, these are amazing horror films. But they make you feel like crap after you watch them. So yeah, they don't really fit our tone. The 80s reboot of The Fly is one of the best horror films of that entire decade, and it features a character who has enough powers that we could turn that into an interesting moveset. 
It is also one giant metaphor for what it is like to watch someone that you love slowly die until their body has withered away and they have become someone that you don't even recognize. So, yeah, it doesn't feel right to include that in our fun, goofy fighting game. And before anyone can say, well, why not use the Fly 2? The Fly 2 sucks, that's why. And I know deciding on a tone for our roster is something that all comes down to personal interpretation. Everyone is going to have a different opinion on what should or should not count for this. So I'm going to try and find a middle ground. I'll put it to you like this. All horror movie villains are horrible monsters who do horrible things. But some of them are treated with brutal realism and sincerity. Some of them are treated like pro wrestlers. Oh my god, here comes Jason with the chair! Speaking of that, before we actually get to the roster, let's also take a moment to discuss how the game would play. Considering the brutal nature of this game, I'd imagine it would take several notes from Mortal Kombat, such as fatalities and brutalities, but for the more unique mechanics, I've got two ideas to help it capture the feel of the horror movies that created these characters. A lot of horror movies tend to follow a formula, a very simple formula. There are certain rules that most villains will abide by, and one of the biggest rules is... Careful. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life for one last scare. Yep, the villain always comes back for one final scare. So let's say that you have a super meter in this game, and let's say it can go up to three bars. If you get KO'd in the final round, mean it would be game over, but you have full super meter, you can use all of that meter to revive yourself with a tiny chunk of life. Not a lot, just a sliver, just enough that that way you can get taken out with one or two more good hits, but it would give you one last chance to take down your opponent. But here's the mechanic that's really important, and it will actually affect who I choose for this roster. Horror movie villains never go all out at the start. They tend to raise the tension throughout the film until the very end when they just go nuts. For example, the beginning of Friday the 13th Part 4? Leave me alone! <laughs> the end of Friday the 13th Part 4? So let's say that every character has their own unique mechanic that can strengthen them as the match goes on. For some characters it can be something like building up some kind of a meter that gives them access to a brand new ability, unlocking brand new moves as the game goes on. For some characters it can be collecting power-ups that level them up. For some other characters it can be just a timer that strengthens them as it ticks away. Every character would be unique, so this wouldn't be a shared mechanic, it's not like every single character would have the exact same power-up meter. It would be more of a shared theme among this roster. Basically, the name of the game is going to be becoming a bigger threat as the match goes on, but every character is going to have a different way of accomplishing that, and I will be going into more details about that as we start covering the characters. But now that we've established the rules and the tones and the playstyle, let's actually figure out that roster size. Now even though I'm completely ignoring any legal rings that we would have to jump through in order to make this impossible game happen, I still want to give it a fairly realistic roster size. It provides more of a challenge to me, and if I don't, then this just becomes a video of me listing off horror movies that I think are cool until I get bored. So to find this realistic roster size, I'm going to look at two other horror-themed fighters. Mortal Kombat has included multiple horror movie characters over the years, and I'd say it's actually one of the reasons why many people want a game like this to exist. MK showed us that it could be done. And we've talked about Netherrealm games a lot on Build the Roster, and over the years we've come to determine that the average roster size for an NRS game is 24 spots. But on the other end of that spectrum, there's a fan game out there that does exactly what I'm doing today. Yeah, I'm sure that a lot of you have already been shouting this out in the comments, but several years ago, a fan game called Terrordrome came out that also brought together horror movie icons, and you know something? It's actually a ton of fun. This is an amazing love letter to the genre, and it's a pretty darn good fighting game all on its own. In fact, I'll go ahead and give these developers a free plug right here. Because this was a fan game, it meant they couldn't possibly make any money off of it. So, they went off and made their own official fighting game made up of their own original characters, also called Terradrome. 
and that game is still in early access, and I will admit, it is still a little rough and it does need more polish. But I've been keeping track of this game for years now, and over that time, it's gotten more characters, graphical issues have been ironed out, and the gameplay has continued to improve. So I feel pretty confident in saying that by the time that they're done making it, this could actually be something special. So if this sounds like something that you're interested in, then go and find them on Steam and check them out. But I'm bringing this up because that Terradrome fan game had a roster of 14 characters. So Netherrealm is over here with 24 characters, the fan game is 14 characters, and right there in the middle is our roster size at 19. Which might be the first time that we've ever had a prime number as our roster size. I kind of hate it. Are we sure that 18 is off the table? No, no, we decided on 19. I'm just going to suck it up and deal with this ugly, ugly odd number. But that's it. That's everything that we had to get out of the way. We've recited the ancient scriptures, solved our mysterious puzzle boxes, and our creepy doll collection is all lined up and ready. It's time to delve into this extra spooky, scary Halloween edition of Build the Roster. <laughs> I don't want to scare anyone, but I'm going to give it to you straight about Jason. His body was never recovered from the lake after he drowned. And if you listen to the old timers in town, they'll tell you he's still out there. Some sort of demented creature. Legend has it that Jason saw his mother beheaded that night. And that he took his revenge. A revenge that he'll continue to seek if anyone ever enters his wilderness again. Jason Voorhees. I'd say that when it comes to horror movie icons, there's three big faces that sit up there at the very top. Jason Voorhees, and two others who I won't say because that would spoil who's coming up. Friday the 13th might not have invented the slasher genre, but thanks to 12 installments, yes you heard me correct, there have been 12 installments of Friday the 13th, and they refuse to make another one, but thanks to 12 installments all running the full slasher movie gambit, from corny, to serious, to comedic, to what the hell were they thinking, to now he's in space for some reason, to a reboot, I would argue that this has become the most iconic slasher series. And that obviously extends to Jason as well. I'd say that when people picture horror movie slasher, the first image that pops into their mind is a hockey mask. Although, as you can tell from those crazy sequels that I just listed off, you wouldn't have to just stick to his classic hockey mask look. Jason has had so many different appearances that you could probably fund this entire game with costume DLC for this one character. Hockey Mask Jason, Baghead Jason, Not Jason, Zombie Jason, Meatball Jason, Jason X, Nintendo Jason. You could get so much money for this game by selling these costumes, and I can guarantee you the pricing still wouldn't be half as sleazy as the guest costumes for your avatar in Street Fighter VI. Guess what was in the news while I was writing this script? So yeah, Jason is obviously in this roster, so let's talk about how he'd play. Jason would be one half all-rounder, one half tank. The tank part is obvious, Jason can take a licking and keep on ticking, so we'd give him some moves with some armor on them, but as for his all-rounder status, Jason uses a machete as his main weapon, so that would give him some decent range, but not too much, and in multiple films he has been seen carrying around ranged weapons, so we would give him some kind of a projectile, and he's even got a bizarre unexplained ability to teleport that sometimes is treated as a joke and sometimes the director just throws up their hands and says, screw it, I guess it's real. So I say we also give him a teleport to help him close the distance, kind of like he had in Mortal Kombat X. So as you can see, he'd have a wide range of moves to give him some good answers to whoever he's going up against, but Jason isn't that fast. I mean, he'd have a lot of attacks that aren't safe and are easy to punish. And as for his power-up mechanic, I mentioned that Jason is arguably the face of horror movie slashers, so let's make his power-up kind of basic. Let's say that one of his special attacks is just a big slash with his machete, but you can burn a bar of your meter to make it an EX version, and each time that you land the EX version of that move, you would hear the classic <laughs> and that would signal that you had done it correct. Every single time that you land it correctly, it would then slightly power up your basic attacks for the rest of the match. 
So that's nothing too crazy, but Jason is meant to be the entry-level character. He's here for the newer players, so we don't want to go too nuts for him. Although if you are looking for someone to go nuts... You want to know who Fred Krueger was? He was a filthy child murderer who killed at least 20 kids in the neighborhood. We found him in an old abandoned boiler room where he used to take his kids. Took gasoline. We poured it all around the place. Then lit the whole thing up and watched it burn. Never sleep again. Please, God. This is God. Freddy Krueger. Another obvious choice, if you got Jason, you need Freddy. They have to fight each other, they made a whole movie about it. Plus, we need a new game with the real Freddy in it. Freddy Krueger has been in Mortal Kombat and in Dead by Daylight, but both of those were based on the reboot version of Freddy, and everyone hates the reboot version of Freddy. So yeah, we need classic Fred Krueger in at least one modern day game, and this would give Robert England one more chance to play his most iconic role. But how would he play? Well, Freddy has control over the dream world, meaning he can transform, create weapons out of nowhere, and change the very laws of reality as he wants. So Freddy would be the most tricky type character that you could imagine. Let him send out projectiles, let him set up traps across the stage, and those traps could trigger over time, or whenever a character walks past them, and those traps could end up attacking the opponent, or maybe they could just inflict some kind of a status effect on them. And what the heck, let's even give him some kind of a projectile grab attack where he can just bounce you around like a pinball. Basically, just make him like JP in Street Fighter VI, mixed with a dash of various sorcerers from Mortal Kombat. And as for his power-up mechanic, Let's say that all of his projectiles and his traps start out kind of small. They wouldn't be that difficult to avoid. But we could give him a grab where he slowly sticks his claw into your head. And after doing that, his projectiles and traps would be a little bit larger, implying that he reached into your brain to learn your fears and now he's using them to make your nightmare stronger. He does that about three or four times throughout the match, and now all of a sudden those tiny traps and projectiles are filling up the entire screen and are next to impossible to avoid. He would be a very high execution character, meaning that his learning curve would be a pain, and his defense would be pretty low, but if you put in the time, you could make him a very dangerous opponent. I met him. Fifteen years ago, I, I was told there was nothing left. No conscience, no understanding, and even the most rudimentary sense of life or death. I met this six-year-old child with this emotionless face. And the blackest eyes. Size. Michael Myers. This to me is the third big phase atop Mount Slasher, and Halloween is arguably the most important horror movie franchise because it's the film that spawned the slasher genre. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't the first slasher film, not by a long shot. There were plenty of other slasher films before Halloween. Just like how there were plenty of other fighting games before Street Fighter 2. But when Halloween came out, everyone pointed at it and said, Oh, this is a thing, and we should all be ripping it off. Hell, the creator of Friday the 13th has even admitted multiple times, Oh, yeah, we were just trying to rip off Halloween because that movie was making so much money. So yeah, while I think Jason is the most iconic horror movie villain, you could totally argue that Michael Myers is the most important horror movie villain. However, when it comes to his playstyle, this was a hard call, because... Quite frankly, what can you give Michael that Jason doesn't already have? Both of them are big guys, really strong, can take a pounding, and love to kill you with sharp objects. However, Jason definitely has more moves at his disposal. Jason will occasionally use projectiles. Michael likes to get in close and personal. And Jason mostly walks, but he has been known to book it when he needs to. Michael, on the other hand, only walks. His target is on the other side of town? He's going to walk there. Someone steals his mask and runs off with it? He's going to walk after them. 
Michael Myers walks more than the monster from It Follows, who is not in this roster for many reasons. So Myers doesn't have nearly as many tools as Jason, likes to get up close and personal, and he's slow. Grappler. Yep, Michael Myers is our big grappler of the game, and I'm not just saying that because like any good grappler, Michael has a weakness to zoners. No, I'm saying it because, think about it, most of Michael's kills all come from him grabbing someone before he stabs them, chokes them, or just beats them to death. And as we have seen multiple times, Michael has supernatural levels of durability. He can take any amount of damage and keep going, which is a trait that any good grappler needs to have. So let's say we give him a quick lunging grab, a grab that chokes you and leaves you stunned to set up for further combos, and most importantly, let's give him a walking command grab that goes full screen. He would be left wide open during this move, but we'd give him one hit of armor to make it safe. However, that leads us into his power-up ability. Michael loves to stalk and stare down his prey. So let's say that if you just take your hands off the controller, you don't move Michael, don't press any buttons, he would tilt his head to the side, and while his head was tilted, it would start filling up a meter. Anytime that meter hits a new level, it would add an extra hit of armor onto that walking command grab, and that would remain for the entire round. The meter would only go up to about two or three levels, but if you fully max it out, that means that for the rest of the round, that walking command grab would be unstoppable. Something that would be music to any grappler fan's ears. Let's make him the horror movie version of Zangief. Or Potemkin. Or actually, no, wait, King from Tekken. Both of them wear masks and don't talk, think about it. and all it's like right out of a horror movie or something there are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie you like scary movies uh-huh what's your favorite scary movie oh come on you know i don't watch that shit why not I'm too scared you never told me your name why do you want to know my name i want to know who i'm looking at see you push the laws and you end up dead okay i'll see you in the kitchen with a knife Ghostface. We got two tanky characters and one tricky semi zoner. Time for some rushdown. And for this role, I'm going with Ghostface because towards the end of the 80s, the slasher genre was dying down until 1996 when Scream brought it roaring back. And I'll even say that Scream might have the best track record out of any slasher franchise. They're not all great, but their heights are groundbreaking and their lows are still way better than the lows of its competitors. But listen, I'm not here to review the Scream franchise, I'm here to talk about how Ghostface would work in our fighting game. As I mentioned, he'd easily be the biggest rushdown character in the game. Ghostface is the anti-Michael Myers. This guy only has two settings, silently stalking and running his cloaked ass off. So yeah, he's going to be all about running up on the opponent and slashes that don't do a ton of damage, but he can combo them together pretty easily for big combos. But as for his more unique moves, well, okay. Spoiler alert for almost every single Scream film. Seriously, if you haven't seen at least two or three of these movies by now, then you might want to skip ahead by two minutes. So, as for his more unique moves, in almost every single Scream film, there's always more than one ghost face. It's almost always two people working together, a new set of two characters in every single film, which would work out great for us because it means that we could create completely new characters for this Ghostface role, and then we could have them tie closely into whatever the big overarching plot of the game is without worrying about screwing around with any pre-existing continuity. So let Ghostface summon out their partner to grab the opponent, stunning them so that way they can run in on them and start comboing. A move that I will admit I am stealing from that Terradrome game that I mentioned earlier, but hey, it's a really good idea. Or let's call on the power of Street Fighter Alpha 2 and give Ghostface a super where his partner hops in and they start mimicking their moves, creating a shadow that allows you to apply extra pressure and open up crazy new combos. But Ghostface has one extra gimmick, his phone calls. 
That's how he always likes to announce himself. He calls you up and torments you on the phone more than someone asking about your extended car warranty. So this could be his power-up mechanic. Give him a move where he calls you up, and as he's calling you, you'd hear a phone ring. Each time you hear the phone ring, it would fill up his own unique terror meter. Once the meter is full for a limited time, his dashes would be replaced with a full-blown run, implying that he has finished sneaking up on his prey and now he's chasing them down, which mechanically would let him cross the field in an instant and keep pressuring you non-stop. Legend has it that it was written by the Dark Ones, Necronomicon Ex Mortis. Roughly translated, Book of the Dead. The book served as a passageway to the evil worlds beyond. In the year 1300 AD, the book disappeared. Lady, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to ask you to leave the store. Ash Williams. We've got multiple villains in here, which makes sense. Nine times out of 10, the focus of a horror movie is the bad guy. But every now and again, there is that rare instance where the hero is the breakout star. And among these horror heroes, none have had a personality as explosive and memorable as Ash Williams. Bruce Campbell's role as the hero in the Evil Dead series propelled him into being one of the greatest B-movie stars of all time. His one-liners are deliciously cheesy in the best ways, and unlike many other horror heroes, he's got a wide range of tools that he can use in a fighting game. He's got his chainsaw arm for some good hang normals and a multi-hang special move. He's got his boomstick for a blast that could lead into wall bounces, and we could even give him the Necronomicon to let him call out some spells. Or, rather than giving him the Book of the Dead, let Ash have his trademark bad luck and the Necronomicon keeps messing with him throughout the match, basically giving him some Frank West style attacks where deadites come chasing after Ash and he can then kick them into the opponent, throw them onto them to stun them, or give him a super where the giant tree monster from the end of Evil Dead 2 breaks through the door and starts attacking the opponent as Ash dives out of the way. If Ash is cursed to always be hunted down by Kandarian demons, he should really be able to use that to his advantage. In fact, his bad luck could even be his power-up mechanic. Ash takes a pounding in every single movie, so let's say that the more damage Ash takes, the more powerful his special moves become. He takes enough damage throughout the match, and now his chainsaw special attack does an extra hit of damage. He fires out two blasts from his gun instead of one. He can summon out larger, stronger deadites to toss into the enemy. If we were giving each character a power-up mechanic, it would make sense that Ash's power-up would just be him getting fed up with getting his ass kicked and finally deciding to fight back. Now, to balance this out, Ash would have some of the least powerful specials when the game begins, but that would actually make sense. Did you see Ash in the first Evil Dead? Yeah, that guy wasn't the groovy hero that we all know today, so we would basically be watching him progress from Evil Dead 1 to Evil Dead 2 to Army of Darkness as his life bar sinks. In fact, if you really want to lean into that, Ash is the king of one-liners, so let's say that he has a taunt that just slightly increases his super meter whenever he does it, but it only activates once he gets halfway through his life, and at that point, all of his taunts would be lines from Evil Dead 2, and then once you get down to a quarter of his life, all of his taunts would be lines from Army of Darkness. It is a very tiny, very specific Easter egg, but the big Evil Dead fans would go nuts. And I know because I'm a big Evil Dead fan, and I would go nuts. Sadako. 
So far, all the characters that we've included have been from American movies, but there's a wide range of international horror films that have created some giant stars and they absolutely deserve to be included. So with that in mind, we have to include in this roster the star of the ring herself, Sadako. The character that made J-Horror explode across the globe for a whole new generation. There is so much about Sadako that has become iconic within the horror community. The legend of how her tape works, how she crawls out of the TV, and just that shot of her eye right before she kills you, all of that easily makes her stand side by side with any of the other characters that we've already mentioned. Now, as for how she'd fight, you might think that our options are kind of limited, but when you look through her entire library, of which there is a lot, you'll see that she does have a complete moveset. Heck, she's even been in multiple films where she fights other ghosts, so there's even precedence for putting her in a fighting game where she fights other horror movie characters. She's got some kind of telekinetic power, so she could use that to push and slam the opponent around the stage. We could turn that creepy walk of hers into a crawl that lets her go right underneath projectiles to get in close. She's got prehensile hair for her basic attacks and grabs. Maybe we could give her a low special where she sucks you down to a well and then spits you out. And of course, we have to give her a teleport where she fades in the TV stack and then reappears behind you. We've got some options is what I'm trying to say. But my biggest idea comes from her power-up. Because rather than increasing her stats or the strength of her moves, her power-up would be an instant kill! Yeah, power-up doesn't have to mean buffs, it can just mean a way to raise the stakes as the round goes on. And prepare for the biggest swing in topics you could possibly imagine in this video, but... You know how in Dragon Ball Fighters, Gogeta has that move that if he charges it up seven times, then it can one-shot the opponent? Well, in the ring, if you watch the curse video, then you get a phone call and you're told that you're going to die in seven days. You see where I'm going with this. Give Sadako a grab where she stares the opponent down and clips from the ring briefly flash on screen. After this happens, a counter gets added to the screen, and Sadako can do a move to make the counter tick down from seven. If you manage to get the counter to hit zero, then she does an attack, and if it hits, it goes into the cinematic of her instantly KOing the opponent. Again, you're going to have to work to pull this off, but it would just be so perfect for her. Also, you know these characters would have unique interactions with each other before and during the matches, and can you imagine Ghostface's interaction with Sadako? The match starts with him pulling out his phone and saying, What's your favorite scary movie? But then a voice comes through the phone that just says, Seven days. And he looks at it like, Wait, what? What the hell was that? That exchange alone justifies her inclusion. Jigsaw. I'm still mostly picking older franchises in this video, which makes sense, the 70s and 80s were the biggest time for horror icons, but we need some more recent characters from some more modern horror films. So for our next character, I'm turning my attention to Saw, which began just recently in... Wait, 2004? Saw is almost 20 years old? Holy crap, that's the scariest thing in this entire video. Alright, screw it, I'll come up with a more modern character later. But Saw is one of the biggest horror franchises of the last two decades. Heck, it's one of the only horror franchises created within the last two decades to have a recurring plot and villains across many installments. Which is really impressive when you realize Jigsaw has technically been dead since, like, the third movie. Yeah, who'd have thought that the guy who builds thousands of murder machines with overly convoluted traps would plan out stuff years after his death? But he did, and he's apparently really good at it. Although, we won't really be using Jigsaw himself because... Well, he's an old man dying of cancer. He's not exactly in fighting shape. Instead, we'll do what Dead by Daylight did when they add the Saw franchise. We'll have our villain be, spoiler for the first few Saw films. Big spoiler. Skip ahead if you plan on watching these movies but haven't yet. Our villain will be Amanda Young in the pig costume. Amanda was a victim of Jigsaw who survived and then became obsessed with carrying out his mission of setting up traps to make people realize that they wanted to live. 
She might not have been as good at it as Jigsaw himself, but she can still fight, meaning that she could fit into this game. And we could have Jigsaw off screen talking to her for her intro and outro quotes, cutscenes in her story, her taunts, and her big super moves, so that way he is still included. And as for how she'd fight, obviously she would set up traps. She would place devices across the screen, some of them your opponent would have to avoid touching, some of them would be stationary and then activate over time to keep your opponent's attention split, she'd have counter moves to make your opponent hesitate to attack, maybe for her big cinematic level 3 super she puts the opponent in some big overly convoluted death machine, and then they have to hit buttons in order to escape, and how much damage they take depends on how quickly they get themselves out of the trap. And all these traps would play into her power up, because the more traps she successfully hits the opponent with, the more Jigsaw tinkers with them off screen to make them stronger, allowing you access to more deadly devices as the match goes on, with every single trap that you unlock being more powerful than the last one, with the ultimate final unlockable trap being the reverse bear trap. How many times did I just say trap during this character? Looking for an old woman. She lives somewhere in the mountains hereabouts. All she can do is take you straight to hell. You go home and you bury your boy. What do you want, Ed Harvey? There's an old graveyard way back deep in them woods. The thing you're looking for is in there. Pumpkinhead. Alright, so far we've only had the big names in here, the standard characters that you would expect from a cast of horror icons. So I have to dig a little bit deeper. I have to pull out something that only the real big horror nerds would know. And first up, I'm going with a personal favorite of mine, Pumpkinhead. The Pumpkinhead franchise never rose to the ranks of the other big stars, or medium-sized stars, but it's built up a cult following that still gets excited whenever anyone remembers that it exists. Pumpkinhead is a demon who is summoned to life to seek revenge for those who have been wronged, and is the star of four movies with the original being directed by the legendary Stan Winston and starring everyone's favorite android, Lance Henriksen, who has continued to return to this series even long after it started going straight to cable. If you're making anything sci-fi or horror related, Lance Henriksen will be there. That man likes to work. But the thing that makes Pumpkinhead stand out the most is his legendary design. Sure, some people complain that it resembles a xenomorph too much, but other people love that it's this menacing, hellish creature that happens to resemble a xenomorph. Pumpkinhead would be another tanky character. His whole gimmick is that he's unstoppable. Once you summon him, he will not stop until he has killed his target. However, we're starting to get way too many tanky characters in this roster, a risk that you're going to run into when you're dealing with unkillable monsters, so we need to give him some kind of a gimmick to help him stand out. Well, Pumpkinhead is powered by a need for vengeance. The stronger the desire for revenge is, the stronger he becomes. So let's say Pumpkinhead is strong, but he's really, really slow, and he doesn't have a lot of great combo potential. But since he can heal back from anything, let's say that whenever he takes damage, a portion of that damage on his health bar will be a different color, and he will slowly heal that back over time. But he'll have a move where he can sacrifice that damage health, and if he does, then it will fill up a vengeance meter. Don't laugh, you've all heard dumber mechanic names. But the vengeance meter will have different levels, and each time that you level it up, Pumpkinhead will get faster, implying that his desire to hunt down his target is growing. So he'd already be one of the strongest characters in the game when he starts, but his big disadvantage would be his speed. But the more that you rank him up, the more he starts to apply some real-time balance patches. Pinhead. 
Yeah, that last one probably wasn't the P head that you were expecting to see on this list, so let's go ahead and bring in the Hell Priest himself, Pinhead. The Hellraiser series was another standout from the height of the 80s horror films, with some of the most disturbing visuals and incredible psychological scares of the decade. And then the franchise plummeted into mediocrity. And then kept on plummeting until it became the horror movie equivalent of the Sony Spider-Man films, where the license owner is only making them at this point so that way they can hold onto the title. But hey, that's good news for us, because it means that if this game ever got made, it probably means that Pinhead would be pretty cheap, making him one of the most realistic grabs for this list. Now, Pinhead himself doesn't really do a lot of actual physical labor. He tends to just stand there admiring his work while he sends out chains to torture his opponents. So that means he's going to be a zoner. But to make him more unique, I'd picture a mechanic basically making him the opposite of Pumpkinhead. While the big pumpkin demon would grow stronger from his own pain, Pinhead would grow stronger from your pain. Pinhead and the other Cenobites are all about drawing joy from suffering, believing it's the height of pleasure. So let's give Pinhead one move where he can hook you with a chain, and as your life drops, his starts to go up and another attack where he snags you in a torture device and it causes your super mirror to drop while his would rise. Think of him like Omega Red from that old Children of the Atom game. I mean, they both have long metal whips that they wrap you up in and they both need a tan. The comparison works pretty well. And these special moves of his would play into his unique power-up. Let's say that above his super meter, there was his puzzle box, the Lament Configuration. And whenever one of these absorption attacks hits the opponent, the box would start to twist and contort. Once you had used both of these special moves enough times, the box would be solved, and then suddenly change would appear all over the background of the stage, implying that he had sucked you into his realm. And from here on out, for the rest of the round, your super meter would slowly drain, implying that he was constantly torturing you within this realm. I know that sounds kind of broken, but it is, and that's kind of the point of these power-up mechanics. Everyone has some kind of a broken ability, you just have to work really hard to make it happen. Pennywise. Okay, I'm just getting all the P names out of the way right now, so that way after this I can give my pop filter a break. We need at least one Stephen King character in here. The man is known as the master of horror, and I can't even count how many of his books have been turned into films, so there has to be a Stephen King representative. But so many of his characters just wouldn't work. Characters like Jack Torrance just don't fit the overall tone of this game. Characters like Annie Wilkes are a bit closer in tone, but they don't really have a lot of potential moves. And I'm not going to put a dog or a car in here so Cujo and Christine are out. Someone right now is making a joke about the Daytona car in Fighters Mega Mix, I just know they are. So that leaves us with Pennywise, but that's fine because Pennywise is arguably King's biggest horror creation. He terrorized kids in the 90s with the TV miniseries, and the movie from just a few years ago actually managed to live up to and arguably surpass the original series. Which means not only does he deserve a spot on the list, but it also means that we easily have two costumes for him right there. Also, we would have to make his taunt in the Tim Curry skin, that honking laugh of his. Do you have Prince Albert in a can? You do? Well, you better let the poor guy out! <laughs> and for the Bill Skarsgård costume, his taunt has to be whatever this was. I've already laid out numerous reasons to include him, but real talk, even if this was a bad choice, I would still be tempted to put him on this list just because of those two taunts. Now as for how he fights, he feeds on fear, and he can transform into whatever your worst nightmare is, so that might seem a little bit similar to Freddy, but Freddy can reshape the dream world to match your fears. That means that he would be more of a zoner, but Pennywise actually turns into your fears, so he would have a wide range of transformation attacks that would give him some good close to mid-range combat. 
And since Pennywise feeds on your fears, maybe he could have a fear status effect that he could place on the opponent. And while the opponent was inflicted with his effect, their life would slowly drain like they were poisoned, or maybe his special moves would do an extra hit of damage. Or, for his power-up, we can make it so that once you've been inflicted with the status effect, the next time you're inflicted with it, it would last a little bit longer, and that would keep stacking throughout the match. Or maybe Pennywise would get different buffs, and those buffs would depend on how many times the opponent had been inflicted with fear throughout the match. Basically, whenever a character gets afflicted with the fear status, you want the other player to feel it as well. Now go to sleep. Hey kid, I'm gonna go kill your sister. You wanna come? <laughs> Chucky. Alright, I can already hear some people saying that this wouldn't work because you must be this tall to enter a fighting game. I know a lot of people are getting Yoda and Soul Calibur 4 flashbacks and they're all panicking about Chucky's potential hitbox. But first off, Chucky's size changes from shot to shot because sometimes he's a doll, sometimes he's a kid in a costume. And you can totally hit a kid with a standing normal attack, I instantly regret saying that, please don't take it out of context. Point is, we could exaggerate his height just a smidge to make it so that standing attacks just barely hit him. But even if we didn't adjust his height, we'd still have to find a way to make Chucky work in this game because it's freaking Chucky. He's the number one name in Killer Dolls and is easily one of the top 10 horror icons of all time. And he might be small, but Chucky's personality is one of the biggest in this roster. You need him in this game, so that way we can see him interact with Freddy and Ash and see who can talk the most smack. I don't care what problems his size might give us, Chucky is going to be in this roster no matter what! As for how he'd fight, he's a super agile rushdown character. Chucky doesn't have a long range, but he makes up for it with how quickly he can run past you and slice you in the ankles. He'd also have plenty of jumps because despite his stubby little legs, Chucky can still manage to hop right up onto people and start stabbing. And as for his power up, just like Sadako, it would be a special move that he would have to power up. But this one wouldn't KO the opponent, although you might wish that it did. For his first five films, Chucky kept trying to swap bodies with someone else. So let's say that he has his voodoo chant as a move. Every time that he does it successfully, you would hear a crackle of thunder off in the distance to let you know that you had just powered it up. Once he had done it enough times and he had shouted out enough Ade, Due, Dimbalas, it would unlock a brand new level 3 super, where he would be able to do a Captain Ginyu style body swap on you. Weird that I have referenced Dragon Ball twice in this video, I wasn't expecting that when I started writing it. Also, we're still going to keep 19 characters in this roster, but 20 is such a nice round number. So tell you what, let's cheat a little in here. Let's say that if you pick Chucky, he would have his classic costume, then as one of his alternate skins, he would have his stitched up costume. But then as another alternate costume, it would be Jennifer Tilly. I mean Tiffany. Who eventually became Jennifer Tilly. God damn the Chucky films get weird. I'm Tiffany, the doll, not the person. <laughs> it's complicated. Now I know some people are still concerned about Chucky's weird hitbox, but you know a good way to address that? By adding another short character with another weird hitbox into the roster. And lucky for us, there just happens to be another perfect candidate. A little green fellow who hails from the other side of the ocean and just loves to cause mischief. Our next fighter is...
Yes, I'm talking Gremlins. It's such an underrated horror classic. And uh, it certainly is not a horror film. Oh, pff, what do you know, Steven? The first Gremlins is totally a horror film. You've got crazy monsters at night cutting people apart in one of the most morbid Christmas stories of all time. It is at least a horror comedy. And if you don't agree with me, then screw it. Consider this my one just for me pick in this roster because I freaking love Gremlins. And it's a horror film that has a crazy Looney Tunes style sense of humor to it that would be perfect for a fighting game. Oh, hey, look at that. Now, you'd of course be controlling Stripe, the leader of the Gremlins from the first film. You could give him some slashing claw attacks, and for his neutral special, he wields a gun. But the Gremlins are practically cartoon characters, especially in that second film. So make Stripe another tricky character. Let him just toss out random items with different effects, summon in other Gremlins to run across the stage or fall from the ceiling and land on the enemy. Basically, make him this game's version of Faust from Guilty Gear. Just a pure chaos engine that throws out random attacks that keeps everyone on their toes, including himself. In fact, give him a chaos meter that fills up each time he uses one of his random items and it hits someone, even himself. Once it's maxed out, he can summon out his gremlin assistants twice as fast, just filling up the screen with so much madness it makes this game look like the bar scene in the first film. And imagine if you beat arcade mode with Stripe, then during the ending credits, Gremlins could just start popping up in front of the screen and messing with the text. Or halfway through the credits, the screen just rips apart, and then all of a sudden you get treated to footage of Gremlins popping up in the other characters' movies and messing with them. You mean to tell me you wouldn't want to see a shot of Gremlins reading out the Necronomicon as they suck Ash into a portal? Or you know what? Cut away from the credits halfway through, and then all of a sudden it just cuts to a quick skit of Gremlins running wild throughout the developer's office as you see all the people who made this game running around with gremlin puppets attacking them. Actually, you know what? Forget all of this. Let's just make a gremlins game. The film which you are about to see is an account of the tragedy which befell a group of five youths. Hitchhiker. Should we pick him up? Oh, he's weird looking. For them, an idyllic summer afternoon drive became a nightmare. Is anybody home? The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. Sally, I hear something. Stop! Stop! The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Leatherface. Leatherface is probably the last truly huge name in horror that hasn't been included so far, so let's finally go ahead and put him out there. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre films might have declined in quality a little over the years. What for the Texas mother do you think, cuz? Try anything you cancel, bro. Okay, a lot over the years. But that original film was still so iconic, so disturbing and terrifying, that it remains one of the most important films for this genre to this day. As for how he'd play, I know a lot of you were going to say that he would be another tanky character. I mean, Bubba is a big boy after all, and that typically translates to tanky stats in fighting games. But no, Leatherface is definitely strong. He can take someone out with just a single hit. But Leatherface isn't some supernatural killing machine. No, Leatherface is flesh and bones just like the rest of us, and he can get hurt and he does feel pain. So Leatherface wouldn't have any armored attacks like Jason or Michael, but the thing that would make him stand out is... Well, he doesn't really have a lot of self-control. Once his family lets him go, he tends to lose himself in the hunt. So Leatherface would be a super unga bunga character, very attack heavy whose objective is to chase the opponent down and keep them too afraid to counterattack. Let's say he has a couple of moves where he swings his chainsaw around, but he'd have another move where he revs the chainsaw up. And while it's revved up, his chainsaw attacks would do extra hits, or they would have new properties that could lead into juggles or longer stun time. But when his revved up state wears off, he would then be left wide open for a moment as he has to recover, capturing how Leatherface goes all in on the attack, often to his own detriment. As for his power-up, let's say that the more you rev the chainsaw up throughout the match, the longer the chainsaw buff would last. Fairly simple, but that's perfect for Leatherface because he'd be another good entry-level character. What 
Well, hey, it's Halloween. I guess everyone is entitled to one good scare. I've had my share. Michael Myers is a human being who killed his sister when he was six years old. And he came after you. You just want to know why you want a glimpse inside his mind. That's why your story is so important. Laurie Strode. As I said with Ash, we can't just have horror villains in here, we need some heroes as well. And the most famous type of horror movie hero is The Final Girl. This is a famous trope of the genre, where the final survivor of a horror film tends to be a young, typically more wholesome female character. And considering about 90% of all horror franchises tend to have Final Girl survivors, I feel like if we're making the ultimate horror movie crossover, we need at least one Final Girl in here. Problem is that most Final Girls don't actually fight. They tend to either just run or survive by using their wits. And the ones who do fight, well, they either wait until the franchise stops being horror and becomes action to do it, or they just don't have a very cool moveset. Sydney Prescott is one of the best final girls in horror movie history, but when it comes to combat, she mostly just wrestles around or gets one or two shots off with her gun. Yeah, that's not really enough to pull from. So, when it comes to final girls who don't just fight back, they fight back with so many tools and attacks that we could build a full moveset around them, there really is only one answer. Rocky from Phantasm 3. But I'm not ready to start explaining what the heck Phantasm is, so uh, let's just go with Laurie Strode. One of the original final girls, and arguably the most iconic, Laurie Strode returned in 2018 for a fourth brand new Halloween timeline. Wait, no, I forgot Season of the Witch. Fifth brand new Halloween timeline and she came back with a vengeance. No longer the frightened babysitter that she was 40 years ago, Lori had spent all those decades preparing specifically to take Michael down, which she finally did. Until the sixth timeline ends up bringing him back. You all know it's going to happen. So yes, because she is arguably the prototype for the final girl character and she eventually turned into a total badass, let's include Lori Strode. Plus, it's Jamie Lee Curtis. And Jamie Lee Curtis is a massive fighting game fan. I play Street Fighter more than you will ever Are you know. right? You're a Ken person. I'm, I'm Who? Cammy. Who? Okay, okay. She literally cosplayed as Vega at EVO one year. I feel like it just makes sense for a character of hers to eventually end up in a fighting game at some point. As for how she'd fight, well, Lori isn't a monster who went out there hunting down victims. No, Lori spent the majority of her life planning for when the monster would come for her so make her a counter-heavy character. She'd have a shotgun for a ranged attack, but the majority of her moves would revolve around getting the opponent to come in and attack her, only to then hit a parry so then she could counterattack, which would actually make her the perfect counterpick for a character who hits hard but has a slow startup on their attacks. A character like, I don't know, Michael Myers? Then again, parries don't work against grabs, so I guess Michael would also be the perfect counterpick to Lori. The two of them just endlessly engaged in a constant war with each other. And since she's meant to counter these monsters, her power-up is simple. Each time your opponent's super meter goes up a bar, it would increase the timing window on her counter, implying that the bigger and stronger the threat becomes, the more she prepares and plans for them. So, at the start of the match, your counter would have to be frame perfect. It would be next to impossible to successfully hit that counter. But by the end of round two, you would now have a good solid window on that counter, and the opponent would be sweating bullets whenever they attack you as they realize that the hunter had now become the hunted. Also, I know not everyone cares about this stuff, but I like unique achievements and trophies in video games. So we would have to have a trophy called Final Girl, that you get for beating survival mode with Laurie Strode. It just makes way too much sense to not do that. You like this one, Mr. Phoenix. It could save your life.
never grow old, Michael. And you'll never die. But you must feed. David. So far, every character I've included has been someone with multiple films on their resume, which makes sense, coming back again and again is how you become a horror icon. But there are those handful of characters who only need one appearance, that one film that makes them a legend. And I would count Kiefer Sutherland's breakout character David, the leader of a pack of rebellious vampires from the Lost Boys, as being such a character. He was able to become a staple of 80s horror films without needing any sequels. What was that? They did make Lost Boys sequels? How have I never heard of- Oh, okay, yeah, that explains it. Well, anyway, David was only around for one film, but I still think that his style and especially that attitude of his would fit right at home in this roster. I feel like if you're making a fighting game full of monsters, you need at least one vampire. However, the vast majority of iconic horror movie vampires are just different versions of Dracula, and I already mentioned why I don't want to do that. So if we need a vampire, I think David is a good fit. Give him all the typical vampiric moves that you would expect, such as turn into a bat for maneuverability and short-range teleports, sucking on blood for a health boost or to slowly increase his stats throughout the match. But as for his basic attacks, well, I'm going to give myself a little bit of leeway on this one because in the film we do see him very quickly jumping around and slashing at some people, so we could interpret that into his basic moveset. But if it was up to me, I would have him fight like an angry brawler. Why? Because just look at him. That's the other reason why I wanted to pick David for this roster. I feel like most times when you get a vampire in a fighting game, they tend to play very sophisticated. But David is a punk. So I say let's lean into that. David isn't going to pull out some classic martial arts or take some noble stance as he does a move. No, he's going to kick you in the stomach and then turn around and high five his vampire bros. This would be the only time you would see a moveset for a vampire in a fighting game that would include a curb stomp. If you look in the mirror and you say his name five times, he'll appear behind you, breathing down your neck. Candyman. 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 Candyman was a tough choice for this list because, as I said, I want to focus more on the fun horror movie characters, and Candyman is a pretty serious figure. One of the greatest strengths of this character in his series is how it focuses on social issues, something that many horror films do that's been a part of horror since the dawn of the genre. But the original Candyman, and especially the latest reboot, takes very serious issues like class and discrimination and racial injustice and puts them front and center. So much so that I had to wonder if putting Candyman in our goofy little fighting game might be a disrespect to the character and what he stands for. But end of the day, the point of this hypothetical game is to celebrate horror icons. And between his famous look, his memorable score, and especially the incredible standout performance that Tony Todd gives this character, I feel like it would be a disrespect not to include him side by side with these other horror giants. As for how he'd fight, Candyman has three big gimmicks behind him. His hook, his bees, and mirrors. The hook is obviously going to be used for melee attacks and maybe we could give him a command grab where he rams it into your chest as he is known to do. But when it comes to the bees, I see him using them sort of for confusion for a lack of a better term. Candyman tends to be less about just jumping out and scaring people, more about focusing on someone and slowly driving them mad. So let's make him a character that just messes with the opponent. Let him use his bees as a projectile, but rather than the projectile doing damage, it stuns the opponent as they try and swat the bees away. Then we could also use the bees to allow him to disappear into a swarm and teleport around the stage, making him a difficult character to keep track of. And as for the whole mirror thing, let's give him a move where you hear someone say, Candyman. Once it's said five times, he would unlock a brand new special move 
where he'd just disappear into a mirror and start slashing up your reflection. It would be one of the most powerful special moves in the game, but again, you would need to be able to successfully get someone to say Candyman that many times, so it would come with a drawback. about to begin. The Tall Man. Alright, now I'm ready to start explaining what the heck Phantasm is. Phantasm is a horror franchise that began in the 1970s and has continued through five installments with the final film releasing in 2016, which I think makes this the longest running horror franchise with a continuous storyline. If you can call it a storyline. You just killed the Tall Man at the end of part two. So, how is he here at the beginning of part three? Uh, it's Phantasm. <laughs> uh. Yeah, Phantasm is known for having one of the craziest and most confusing plots of any horror series, with time travel and different dimensions and characters dying and coming back, even within the same film, and dreams within dreams within dreams that might be real? It's a lot to get through. However, despite a plot that's so confusing even the people making the movies don't understand it, these films have still found a dedicated audience and have become an important corner of horror history. And that's all thanks to the big villain of the series, the Tall Man. This interdimensional evil acts as a funeral home attendant, which would make for a great stage for this game, and he abducts dead bodies to turn them into shrunken slaves while hunting down his victims with floating silver balls. I promise you that description didn't even come close to capturing how weird this series really is. The Tall Man is iconic for his overbearing appearance and the way that Angus Scrim delivers every line. Anyone who has ever seen these films will always have Why? stuck in their head for the rest of their life. As for how he'd fight, this would be another huge zoner for the game. For starters, he's called the Tall Man for a reason. Those long limbs of his would give him some pretty good range on his normal attacks. But more importantly, the Tall Man doesn't physically fight that much. He tends to let his floating sentries do the work for him. So he'd mostly stand there as his silver balls fly around the stage, and let's say that he's got a special move where one of them drills into your head, but if he hits you with the EX version of that move, then it can upgrade the balls to the gold or crimson versions to do even more damage and have additional properties to the attacks. And for his big level 3 super, he would summon in his giant city-destroying ball to nuke the entire screen. God, did I mention these movies are weird? And yet I still kind of love them. Although, speaking of weird, we're getting close to the end here, which means it's time for the weird pick. Yes, if you've been with us for a while, then you know that in each of these rosters, I always say you need that weird pick, just to get people talking and to make the roster more interesting. But typically, weird pick translates to obscure pick. And what even is an obscure pick when it comes to horror? Some people will say that the Tall Man and Pumpkinhead are obscure. While other people will have the Tall Man and Pumpkinhead tattooed on their chest. Horror fans are so diehard that there's no such thing as a real obscure character to them. However, weird pick doesn't have to mean obscure. It just means character you wouldn't expect to be in this game. So for my weird pick... Favorite couch tomato, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark.
Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Elvira is one of the biggest names in horror, and it's not even because of any of her movies. No, Elvira got her start as a horror host. She'd dress up in her iconic outfit and welcome everyone to her movie macabre showcase, where she would show off old forgotten horror films while stopping every now and again to throw in her own MST3K-style commentary. And the horror host has been a tradition for this genre ever since the dawn of television, whether it's been on local public access channels or on nationwide dedicated movie channels. Heck, you could even say that horror YouTubers are still carrying on this tradition today. So, while it might not be the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of this roster, I would say that a horror host absolutely deserves a spot, and Elvira is easily the most famous among them. In fact, she's gone beyond just being a small-town spooky show woman and has even gotten her own movies, and I'd even argue became a spokesperson for Halloween itself. When I was a kid, the moment that you started to see the leaves change outside, you would see her on TV everywhere selling anything from Pepsi to Blockbuster. As for how she'd fight, well, she is a witch, so we could give her some magical spells, but instead, I've got a really out there idea for this one. Elvira was a horror host, meaning she would introduce other horror characters. So, let's make Elvira a summon fighter. For all of her special moves, she would call out some classic Hollywood monsters to attack for her. As I said, I wouldn't want to include characters like Dracula, or a mummy, or Frankenstein, or the Wolfman, because they don't exactly match the tone of the other characters that we're including, and because they're just too generic. There's thousands of Draculas and Frankensteins, it wouldn't be special to put them in here. But having them run out for Elvira's specials to give her a helping haunted hand? Yeah, that would be perfect! Have Frankenstein run in and punch the opponent so hard that leads into a wall bounce. The Wolfman pounces on them and slashes them down, causing a ground bounce. The Mummy whips some bandages around, which would be great for keeping air juggles going. Basically, she would have some pretty basic normal attacks, but all of her specials would be perfect for combo extensions. Summoning out Spooky Assist would be perfect for a horror host, and hey, like I said, I've seen all the commercials she used to do. I know Elvira hangs out with these ghouls on the weekend. She would absolutely call on them for help. And Elvira is all about showmanship. She loves the spotlight. So let's give her a star power meter, and it fills up whenever she taunts, which she would have plenty of time to do while her assists are out there doing combat for her. Whenever the star power gauge hits a new level, she can then summon out her assist even quicker, lean into brand new combo potential. And now it's time for the final character in our roster, and so far we have had so many legendary horror figures on this list, but we're still missing something all fighting game crossovers need. The new hotness. We need that brand new character, that one who hasn't been in too many films and they haven't been around for a long time, but they definitely made a big impact on the genre. And I think I got a good answer for that. When I was a kid, I went to that boardwalk with my parents. I ended up in that hall of mirrors. There was another girl in there. There's a family in our driveway. Creep on in, on in, on in. Huh? Who is that? a family. Child scared of a family? Picking what character would be our representative for modern day horror movies was tough. Partly because even though there are dozens of amazing new horror films coming out each year, not a lot of them have faces. They don't really have mascots, for lack of a better term. There's definitely a few, there's a handful of them, but the ones that do exist don't really feel like they would work in a fighting game. I mean, The Quiet Place has been a pretty successful franchise so far, but the Angels of Death in there, we never really see them do all that much other than just kill you in a second. The Babadook blew up and was incredibly popular, but I already addressed him at the start of this video. Again, he does not have a full moveset, and even if he did, when you think about what he's meant to represent, uh, it's a little bit too dark and serious for the fun, goofy fighting game that we're trying to put together here. And I know a lot of people are throwing out Art the Clown right now, 
but I'm not including Art the Clown and Pennywise in the base roster, and I'm sorry, Art, but Pennywise takes this one. However, Red, the face of the tethered from us, could provide some really unique gameplay, making her a fun wildcard addition. For starters, if we're looking for a modern day horror representative, grabbing someone from a Jordan Peele film just makes sense. He's easily made the biggest splash in the genre over the past decade, being the first filmmaker to win an Oscar for a horror film since... Oh jeez, Silence of the Lambs in 1991? Wow, the Oscars hate horror films, don't they? So I wanted to get a Jordan Peele representative in here, but nobody from Get Out or Nope would fit. And with Nope, I mean that quite literally. But the more that I thought about Us, which I love by the way, I'm just gonna take a moment right now to say, I know a lot of people give this movie crap because it wasn't as good as Get Out, but I still love the hell out of this film. The concept is so original and chilling. This film stuck with me and gets better each time that I watch it. But as I was saying, the more that I thought about Us, the more I realized that Red would be perfect for this game. For starters, she's got a very unique look, which every good horror icon and fine game character needs. I remember Halloween 2019, I was seeing a whole bunch of red jumpsuits running around that year. But as for how she'd fight, well, she's got her scissors for some good stabbing normal attacks, and she could call on her family for a special or a super move, like let's say she has a super where her son Pluto jumps on the enemy and then explodes, like Chaozu in Dragon Ball Fires. Oh my god, why do I keep referencing that game so much in this video? But what would make her really unique? And the thing that made me realize she would be perfect in a fighting game is that at the end of us, mild spoiler alert for us, tune out now if you haven't seen it. But at the end of us, Red and her above ground counterpart get into a fight. And Red shows off she is quite the dancer as she keeps spinning around and dodging everything her opponent throws at her. So let's make Red's gameplay based entirely around agility. Let's give her tons of dodges and dips and ducks and dives. Let's make it so that she can get across the screen quickly with one quick twirl. Or if the opponent tries to counterattack her, then she just spins right around her and then stabs them in the back. She wouldn't hit hard, but it would be really hard to hit her. But if you're still not convinced that she would be a good pick for this game, check out my idea for her level three. In Us, Red is the leader of the Tethered, duplicates of people on the surface who come from underground tunnels to kill their counterparts. So for Red's level three, she just steps aside and summons in a duplicate of the opponent just now in a red color pattern. They'd stay out there and fight until they were KO'd, at which point Red would come back out, but they would start with a significantly reduced health bar, like let's say only about a fourth of your starting life. However, we could give Red some kind of a power-up that would increase that starting life for each time it was activated. And again, as a big fan of unique trophies and achievements in fine games, we gotta make some kind of a trophy for defeating an opponent with their tethered counterpart called One of Us. And yes, I realize that's a reference to a completely different horror film, but the wordplay just works way too well. Point is, I know some people are arguing why we should include another modern day icon, but A, we still need that really agile character in this roster. Not a rushdown character, just an agile character, and Red would definitely fit that. But more importantly, the moment I thought of that level 3 super, I knew it had to be Red. It's just too good. And there is your ghastly cast of frightful fighters. Ash Williams, Candyman, Chucky with Tiffany as an alternate skin, David from The Lost Boys, Elvira, Freddy Krueger, Ghostface, Jason Voorhees, Jigsaw, or more accurately, Amanda Young with Jigsaw as support, Laurie Strode, Leatherface, Michael Myers, Pennywise, Pinhead, Pumpkinhead, Red the Tethered, Sodico, Stripe the Gremlin, and the Tall Man. And you know something? I'm going to throw out there one more character. Sort of. Yeah, I said that we would only have 19 characters, but that's because I'm trying to be realistic with how many characters you could fit into this base roster. But as I showed with Chucky and Tiffany, there are ways to sneak in bonus characters without having to program a whole new fighter. So here's my idea. In Darkstalkers, the king of monster fighting games, there was a secret character called Shadow, and Shadow would simply pick a random character and possess them. Then when you beat an opponent, the shadow would then come out of your fighter and possess the opponent. And in the next match, you would then be controlling them, constantly changing who you played on as you went through the arcade ladder. It was a really cool idea that spiced up the idea of a random select. So I say, we bring that exact same concept back for this game, because I have the perfect monster to be a substitute for shadow.
Yep, John Carpenter's The Thing. Put in here a special code on the character select screen, and then you unlock this twisted body of alien flesh. But as soon as the match begins, it would transform into a random other character. And if you beat the opponent, the thing would then morph into them and possess their body, slowly spreading throughout the entire roster. The thing is a classic, and it definitely deserves some representation on this list, and this would be a nice hit and treat in the game that you wouldn't have to work too hard to make happen. So there is your starting roster, and if I do say so myself, I'm pretty happy with it. We got enough of the big standard names in there, we got some interesting choices. But if you'll notice, there's still one character that we haven't talked about yet. The boss. Who the heck are these characters going to be fighting? Well, the way I see it, there's two ways that we can go with this. Personally, I would love it if the boss was different for every single character and we use some kind of a rival system. Anytime that there's a crossover fighting game and you get all these different franchises to come together, I love to see these characters interacting. And I'll admit, some of these characters are not going to have the deepest connections to each other. I mean, Jason Voorhees and Michael Myers would have a cool fight, but they wouldn't really have a very deep, in-depth conversation before the match. But if we put some kind of a story into the arcade mode, then you could of course have a narrator discuss what's going on and why these characters are fighting each other, and I think that would work. But the other reason why I like the idea of every single character having a unique rival boss fight is for mechanical purposes. Throughout this entire video, I've been laying out to you this idea that every single character would have some kind of a power-up mechanic, some way of making them a bigger threat as the match goes along. So let's say that when you fight your unique rival in the arcade mode, that character would be at their max level at all times. Whatever their unique power-up is, it would be on full blast the moment the round begins. You're going up against Pinhead, he's already got you in his dark dimension and it's going to be hard for you to build up your super meter throughout that fight. You go up against Michael Myers, he has got unlimited armor on that walking command grab of his from the moment the match begins. You go up against Sadako, she doesn't have to do the grab to you to initiate the countdown to her insta-death, it's already there, so you gotta make sure that you beat her before it hits zero. You go up against Chucky, don't let him get to level 3, he will try and do the body swap on you because he's already recited the chant. You go up against Ash, you're not going up against Evil Dead 1 or Evil Dead 2 Ash, he is in Army of Darkness mode the moment the round begins. So putting in rival fights as the boss fight would be a great way to not only get unique interactions between these characters or build some kind of a story between them, but also it would take the mechanic that we have been building this entire game around and put it on full display. However, I know not everyone would be okay with that. I know that there are people out there who want a unique, specific final boss, and I can understand why. So, if we decide to go that route, and we decide to have a specific character be the final boss, will I mention that The Exorcist is considered by many people to be one of the scariest films of all time? And it is indeed a big important horror franchise, with multiple films being released over the decades. Heck, a brand new one just got released a few weeks ago, and it had a TV show not that long ago, so yeah, this series still has some legs to it. However, I said that we couldn't use Reagan as a character in this game because Reagan never left the bed. However, Reagan was just the little girl who was possessed in The Exorcist. The demon that was possessing her was called Pazuzu. So, considering that this roster already includes multiple characters who can go into hell and other dimensions and the nightmare world, I say we make the final boss Pazuzu. Not only will this pay tribute to one of the biggest horror films of all time, but also we can kind of just do whatever we want with Pazuzu. We saw what Reagan could do when she was possessed by the demon, and we've seen what other characters possessed by Pazuzu are capable of but we would actually be going up against Pazuzu itself. That means we can just invent a brand new moveset for it and just give it whatever we want to make it a perfect final boss fight. Heck, we could give it two stages where in its second form, it just becomes a giant onslaught apocalypse style final boss that takes up the entire screen and maybe you gotta defeat its hands first and then climb up to its head to take it down. We could just go nuts with this thing. And if you can't tell from the rest of this roster, 
I kind of like the idea of going nuts with this game. But there you go, that is the complete roster for this horrifying game and the final boss. That is a complete package. That is one full fighting game. But you know, there's so much more that we can do to make this the ultimate horror fighting game. There's so much more that we could fit in here. So many more places for references and characters and Easter eggs. Am I talking about DLC? Yes! And so much more. So much more that we're going to save it for next time. Yes, folks. This is one of the only times this has ever happened in which a builder roster is going into a part two. Hey, I told you guys at the beginning of this episode, I love me some horror movies. And you give me the opportunity to start blabbing about them, I'm going to take it. And this ended up being one of the longest episodes of Builder Roster we've ever done. And we didn't even get to the DLC. And this was one of the smallest rosters we ever had. So yes, we are going to come back later this month to celebrate Halloween with the second part of this extra spooky Builder Roster. In that episode, we will be covering all the characters that we have for DLC, so if you enjoyed this episode and you want to see me ramble on about other horror movie characters who could possibly be turned into fighting game characters, make sure that you click that subscribe button and ring that bell so that way you know when the episode goes live. And if you want to get an early sneak peek of that episode, you can always follow the link in the description down below to our Patreon. There you can get early looks at videos, vote on upcoming topics that we cover, access to our Discord, and your name in the credits of these episodes, like all the fine people whose names are going up on screen right now. Folks, I just want to thank you one more time for tuning in and watching all the way to the end of this extra spooky edition of Build the Roster. This might be the most amount of work I have ever put into an episode of Build the Roster. Seriously, between trying to come up with all the different mini trailers for every single character while trying to splice everything together so that way this episode hopefully doesn't get a copyright claim, knock on wood. This episode was a lot of work, but you know what? I enjoyed it, and I hope that you did too. Build the Roster is fun because, hey, you get to imagine what characters could possibly be put into a fighting game, but to me, the big appeal of Build the Roster has always been not just naming off characters you would want to see in a game, but trying to figure out how you could adapt characters who are not from a fighting game into a fighting game. And today, I got to do that for an hour and a half with a topic that I love. So thank you all. I really hope that you guys enjoyed this episode too. If you did, then please give us a thumbs up and leave a comment down below. Those are the things that let YouTube know to promote this video around. It's a small thing, but it really does help this channel grow. Thank you all again for tuning in today. If you want to find me around the web, then you can find the links to all my socials in the description down below. And I will see you all later this month for a whole lineup of spooky content that we have planned. Thanks for tuning in today, everyone. Stay safe out there, and happy Halloween.